Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Router channel. Now that Denny Villeneuve's second Dune movie is finally with us, at least 50 YouTube commentators have done reactions, reviews, and analyses, and people all over the internet are talking about it. I had not planned to join in with that. I thought there are enough people talking about Dune, and besides, I'm going to be kind of late <laughs> with it anyway, because... I'm not going to brave the lines to see something right away. Nonetheless, after seeing it, I was sufficiently impressed that I changed my mind. It definitely merits my consideration, if at least because of the incredible staying power of the Dune franchise. To paraphrase Sam Elliott's character in The Big Lebowski, the Dune abides. <laughs> many science fiction novels are fortunate enough to have a screen adaptation. Or in some cases, it's unfortunate if we consider, for example, Starship Troopers. But anyway, very few get one adaptation, even fewer get three. If you don't count the fourth, the first one that was attempted back in the 70s, it didn't get made. Especially considering that Frank Herbert's Dune was rejected by every single science fiction publisher that he pitched it to. That's a sure sign of the imbecility of the business class. You know, it's kind of like the Beatles being not signed by a record label. Oh, no, we don't like your stuff. <laughs> now, most of you, well, some of you that are Dune fans probably know who did first publish the first Dune book, Chilton. They are a company that does auto repair manuals. <laughs> <laughs> because he just couldn't find anybody else. But you got to hand it to him, Perseverance. And eventually, Putnam took it up, but you got to say, they got to have been a little ashamed that they, that they refused it the first time. <laughs> we were idiots. <laughs> anyway, you all know what happened afterwards. Not only did the book achieve uh, great popularity, Critical acclaim, winning the very first Nebula Award in 1966. But Herbert himself wrote five sequels to the book. And after he died, there were almost 20 more, I think around that number, by his son, Brian, and also uh, hiring Kevin J. Anderson to pitch in. So it's been wildly popular. I have only actually read the first three, possibly four. Pretty sure it was just three. And at some point, I may go back and, and do some more. But anyway, I have read the first one recently again. And I very rarely read any over. And I got to say, I enjoyed it as much the second time as the first. Anyway, after this great popularity, there was a, I think, Franco-Chilean director named Alejandro Jodorowsky who wanted to do it, and he had the rights, and he was going to do it in the mid-70s, but that just didn't come about. He was spending too much money. He was getting too elaborate. It sounded like being pretty awesome. And even today, there are channels. There was one channel, I know, the guy was posting solely about Dune every time, about the Dune universe. But we did switch over to Foundation, so I think he likes these really popular uh, epic franchises. So, in any case, what is behind Dune's fantastic success? Why has it lived so far beyond its creator, such that, you know, his son had to take up the helm, that he had to hire another guy to write for it, and to do even more Dune books? I don't style myself a literary expert, but after reading a few hundred, maybe as many as a thousand science fiction novels over my lifetime, I think I'm qualified to talk about what makes a great sci-fi novel. And now I'm going to offer you my hypothesis on what makes the Dune series so special. First of all, Dune is a classic story. It's a classic heroic saga with its larger-than-life heroes and villains. The heroes, though, are human with their own human failings. The villains, some of them seem to have no... <laughs> no redeeming characteristics, although others do. You know, like the Emperor, I don't think he's entirely bad. He's got at least some smarts behind him. And 
even though he's kind of old by the time Dune comes around. The components of this story, of this saga, they include a lot of action and conflict. They have philosophy and religious uh, ideology in the background. And there's, of course, romance, which is not a big component in a lot of science fiction, but this one it is. There are quotable quotes. My favorite and perhaps the best known is, fear is the mind killer. It's actually something you could live by, you know, because it is something that kills your rationality. The sleeper must awaken. He that controls the spice controls the universe. And there was one more. I could not find it when I searched it. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't know where my physical copy of Dune is. But it had to do with a quote of Paul by the Princess Irulan, of course, at the beginning of one of the chapters. Something to affect that a man whose mind is controlled by religion can never be fully human. Interesting aspect <laughs> of this philosophy. Now, there was an environmental component to Dune, which I think was really resonant in the 60s with all the environmental uh, worry about the time. And I think in the backstory, there's something about Dune having once been a normal planet and it was desertified by the worms you know, digging up everything and capturing all the water. Uh, not entirely sure if I'm right about that. I think it was in like one of the second or third novels that they mentioned this, which brings to mind the superb world building and such a well-crafted story arc. This world building is what made the books so difficult to adapt, but so appealing, such an irresistible challenge. And when they were made, the visuals... It had to be sweeping. It had to be epic. And just one of those things, one of those visual things, is worm riding. And you got to say, it's really portrayed differently in the 1984 version by David Lynch and this later 2021, 2024 version. In the early version, Kyle MacLachlan is standing there on the worm, looking noble, with his two hooks, controlling it, and he's just kind of, Kind of smug, kind of looking smug, and, and just just gliding through the desert very serenely. But in the new version, first worm ride, man, it's epic. It's like worm is crashing through these dunes, and the sand is flying everywhere. And if he wasn't wearing goggles, he would not be able to see. And luckily, he has this thing up his nose so he can breathe all that sand going everywhere. That is how it would really be, I think. Much better imagined. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about worm riding a little later because it's something that Mrs. Desperado said. Dune, unlike a lot of other novels, sci-fi novels of the time, has a significant role for women. Uh, but it does not pretend, like the day and age we are living in now, that there is no difference between men and women. Indeed, the differences are part of what make the story. One of my favorite aspects is the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. It is a female organization that is plotting the future of mankind with selective breeding and so on. And uh, they are kind of sinister, but also well-intentioned, it seems. <laughs> very cold-blooded, let's say. But I like that. It, it has a very female type of uh, plotting uh, machinations, that kind of thing, that I think... Uh, goes well with the way the sexes really are. Of course, we have the Fremen, who are pretty egalitarian for a desert tribe. The women can go fight with the men. But I don't think that most of them do, because in the book, they mention how so many men were killed in battle that a lot of the women ha had to you know, be one of plural wives, <laughs> because otherwise they wouldn't have a mate. Uh, and so... I think the idea is that, yes, women can fight, but they're not expected to. You know, that motherhood is just as important. So I like that aspect of it. Now, one thing you'll probably never see, and one thing that I was actually jarred because I had forgotten about it, and the fact that I forgot about it, you know, the way my mind works, is astonishing. The Fremen, as Islamic as they seem, they have occasional spice-fueled orgies. Believe it or not, it is in there. It is in there. And I think that's because 
they don't want their genes to get stale. You know, they don't want inbreeding. They are so isolated. These tribes are from different places. And that way you get a little mixing going on. And it sounds like something that the Bene Gesserit would have engineered. You know, oh yeah, let's make sure they don't get stale. <laughs> that they don't, they don't end up like the Habsburgs with a, a bunch of imbeciles. <laughs> now that we've addressed the unconventional view of sex in parts of this book, I have to go back and talk about the book's inherent conservatism. And in fact, Herbert was a conservative. I believe he was a Republican. He supported Richard Nixon, and he hated the Soviet Union, as any good American should. But at the same time, he opposed McCarthyism with his blacklist. He opposed the Vietnam War. So I'd say he was kind of a libertarian, really. And because of Frank Herbert's conservatism, it showed in his books, and it kept the book from being one of those 1960s books that's pursuing the next big fad, and therefore it remains timeless. I can think of a number of novels that I enjoyed that were written back in the 60s and the 70s, and even the early 80s, that just don't seem to stand the test of time. They just seem too much creatures of their own age. Uh, for example, Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land, a very counterculture type uh, book that really anticipates the counterculture in 1961, in which he coins the word grok, among other things, that became a staple, something hippies said. Stand on Zanzibar. I don't know how many of you know that one, but it was written by John Brunner in 1968 about overpopulation. Another fabulous book, but very much a book of the 60s. Then there was Samuel R. Delaney's 1975 epic, well, epic in size, Dahlgren a rather bizarre and sometimes confusing book that I enjoyed very much, probably because I read it in an altered state of mind. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, that, you never hear about that anymore. And of course, there was William Gibson's Neuromancer, one of the epic, most prime examples of cyberpunk, and yet it's never been adapted. And it almost seems kind of dated now when you go back and look at it. Dune, however is not about the next big thing. It's not about the current fads. It's about actual human history. Herbert had a lot of knowledge of history and uh, different cultures, and he was real read in other religions like Islam and Zen Buddhism and so on. And so, of course, we find out that many of the Fremen terms are, in fact, Arabic, like Shahalud and Wabib. And although the Fremen are actually supposed to have some Zen influences, which I think has to do with the, the spice and the uh, mind-expanding aspects of that substance. And a lot of it was influenced by actual history as well. There was a book called Sabres of Paradise, written in 1970 by British historian Leslie Blanche. And I had to read it because I heard about its influence on Dune. It's about the war between the local... Caucasus Mountains tribes, most of them who were Muslims, and the Russian Empire, as the Russian Empire was expanding to the south. And the tribes eventually lost, but they put up a good fight. And there was this one guy in particular, can't recall his name, but he was kind of an imam of one of these tribes, considered kind of a prophet, which is a heretical notion, by the way, because Muhammad was the last prophet, but nonetheless, um, nonetheless, he was a very austere very uh, self-sacrificing and noble type of character. And I think he had a lot to do with the inspiration for Paul Atreides. And so a lot of ideas in Dune are lifted directly from this book, including some of the terminology for weapons and so on. I think the word siege, siege is like a word from that culture. So it's very interesting, this interplay with actual history. Now, not everybody loved Dune. Uh, in particular, J.R.R. Tolkien refused to review it. Being a devout Catholic, he didn't like the book's cynical view of religion. And I have talked to people who say it's boring, or, you know, millennials who say it's pretentious with all these people and their grand schemes, and it could never come about. Well, I don't know. Maybe millennials don't have grand enough schemes in their lives. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> but anyway, I've read it twice, and I seldom ever read a book more than once, because I'm trying to experience as many as I can in my lifetime. Now that I've addressed why I think Dune has stood the test of time, I want to talk a little bit about the Villeneuve movies. 
and my impression. Might as well, right, since I'm on the topic. They are incredible, among my favorites. I think they stand right up with the Lord of the Rings adaptations. However, however, unlike those which were very faithful to the book, these are not. <laughs> and the funny thing is that they are less faithful than the other two adaptations. Uh, to the source material, I mean. Villeneuve's story, his script, makes several significant changes to the original story of Dune. In particular, where China is concerned, they make her somewhat more of a rebel, I think, if I recall. And she's got a little bit more conflict with the rest of the tribe. She was always a strong female character. But I think they had to make her even stronger because of the current age. The casting. The casting is far better than the previous incarnations. I especially like Timothy Chalamet, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, as Paul Atreides. He's got this kind of Middle Eastern, uh, Mediterranean look. In fact, he is half Jewish. <laughs> That's as exotic as he gets. But he looks the part, and he looks younger than he really is. Right now, he's 28 years old. And Paul definitely looks younger on the screen, and he's supposed to be younger. I believe he's supposed to be like a late teenager when he comes to uh, Arrakis, Desert Planet, Dune, <laughs> as they keep saying in the 1984 version. I like his acting. He's kind of understated, as I see Paul should have been, except when he has to, you know, get all crazy, and, you know, to inspire the troops and so on. Uh, which he does when he needs to. I like him a lot better than Kyle MacLachlan as Paul in the 1984 Lynch version. Surprisingly enough, they were the same age. MacLachlan was in his mid-20s also when he did that one. And yet he didn't look as young for whatever reason. I don't know why. Of course, I liked Rebecca Ferguson as the Lady Jessica in these movies. She is stunning, and she looks at even all bedraggled in her desert gear. And uh, the first one, in part one, we had Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto, and he was very noble and very cool-looking Duke. I thought he was as ducal as any Leto ever was. Too bad they had to kill him off, but the story did that, so there's no getting around it. All the Harkonnens, They are amazing. They are fantastic. They are so evil. And these guys, these three actors do such a great job. It's astonishing. Now, I know a lot of fans have complained about Zendaya as Chani. Uh, I don't really see the problem. I didn't have a real issue with her. Like, I didn't care much for Sean Young as Chani either in the 1984 version. I always thought she was weird. <laughs> and, and, you know... The Czech actress they did as Chani in the 2000 sci-fi series was gorgeous, but that's kind of an anomaly because Chani is a desert girl. She's not supposed to be that pretty. She's supposed to be tough and fearsome, and that's why Paul loves her, not because she's gorgeous or anything like that. But I don't know. Maybe the fans don't think she's cute enough, or maybe they just don't like Zendaya for some reason. I have no clue. I don't know about any of her previous work. I believe she was in Disney or something goofy like that. Those Disney series can be very annoying, so I can understand that. <laughs> But I do think they should have gotten her a dialogue coach because her speech is just the same as Paul's. She does not have the kind of accent that the other actors were doing, Fremen were doing. I mean, I just, I found that jarring and that would have made it a little bit better. Now, this comes to another issue I have with the casting in that they cast a woman as Liet Kynes, the planetologist, who is supposed to be Chani's father. And that's important because that makes Chani an outsider because she's only half Fremen. But in this case, I don't know why they cast this particular character. I believe that was probably the only one they figured they could wangle a gender swap. They shouldn't have done it. Sorry, shouldn't have done it. I don't care that... They made Leah Kynes black, but he should not have been a woman. <laughs> anyway, I was talking about Rebecca Ferguson. Uh, the lady Jessica, Paul's mother, is always played by a very attractive actress. So if the male fans don't like that Chani isn't hot, doesn't matter. You've got other pretty women to look at, okay? Including Princess Irulan is always a very attractive actress. 
And uh, personally, it's why I, I find Paul's devoted monogamy kind of puzzling. Because <laughs> he ends up being officially married to Irulan, but he never has anything to do with her because he's so devoted to Chani. Well, good for him. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, imperial prerogative, you can have a wife and a concubine, but that would have complicated the story too much because then Paul would have had children by both of them, and that was not the way Herbert wanted it to play out. Now, there was a brief moment of confusion, uh, even for me as a Dune fan. Uh, in it, there was a scene, and I'm not quite sure why they included it because it's not as important as a lot of the scenes that they left out, uh, in which uh, Lady Fenring who is another Bene Gesserit sister, has a one-night stand with Phaedrotha Harkonnen. <laughs> and she kind of approaches him and comes on to him, and they have sex, and she has his child, or she, at least she's pregnant with his child. And it's part of the Bene Gesserit uh, breeding program. And maybe it was just to illustrate how cold-blooded they are, because he's a monster. I mean, he's an interesting monster. And in fact, they make him even more monstrous than, you know, Sting was great as Phaedrotha, in the 84, but Sting was just fun, cool evil. But this guy's creepy evil. I mean, he's in a cannibalism for God's sake. <laughs> but anyway, the confusion was that the actress who plays Lady Fenring looked a lot like the actress who plays Erlon. And I was momentarily confused. Then I realized, oh yeah, Lady Fenring. And actually, Mrs. Desperado said, oh, but Irulan went and had sex with the Harkonnen. How could that be? And I said, no, 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 that wasn't her. But I can understand how you'd be confused because they do look kind of alike. And there's all these, you know, she's got this hood on and she doesn't show a lot of her face. Visuals, of course, are nothing short of stunning. They are far better than David Lynch's 1984 version. But, of course, the technology. I mean, you can't blame Lynch for that. And it's not even the same league with the Sci-Fi Channel because they had a really crappy budget, which is sad, because I think they really wanted to do the best job they could, and they did do a good job. Some of the crowd scenes, too, are very impressive with thousands of people, probably computer-generated, I would imagine. And in those huge vistas, the uh, giant buildings, the spaceships, the uh, spice harvesters, the flying machines, which really do look like they're ornithopters. They actually look like dragonflies. Their, their wings actually flap. And they were cool. And the scenes on the Harkonnen planet, oh my God, creepy. I don't know how it, they're supposed to have a white sky and a black sun. It makes no sense, but it was stunning. Uh, now, the music, it can be a bit overdramatic. And frankly, because we were in one of those IMAX type places, I couldn't hear myself think he was so loud. I'm an old man and I'm going to complain about this, the loudness of this movie. <laughs> no, it was fine. Uh, one more thing I have to say. Mrs. Desperado's first comment as we left the movie, she said, I don't care what they say. You can't drive a worm. How can you drive a worm? That makes no sense. It's just going to submerge. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Do a little bit of mansplaining here. The book explains it. You can ride a worm because... You use those hooks, you open its segments, and it can't go under because the sand would, would uh, irritate its tender innards. In fact, I loved how they did this in the 1984, where uh, Paul is up along the side of the worm. He grabs the two hooks, and he pulls it open, and the worm starts to turn. That's where the saying came from, by the way. <laughs> and no, not really. But he, the worm is turning and, and bringing him up to the top because it wants to keep that segment as far away from the sand as possible. So that explains worm riding. You can direct it. You have the two hooks, so you can steer it. <laughs> Why don't they shake off the riders? I don't know. Maybe they're too dumb, or maybe the riders have just figured out a way to make it hurt more if they try to get rid of you than if they just bear with you. But Mrs. Desperado did make me promise that I was going to give a shout out to the original Worm Rider. It was not from Dune. It was from SpongeBob. <laughs> the original Worm Rider was Sandy the Squirrel riding the Alaskan Bullworm. So look that one up. It's pretty cool. To sum up, Dune abides because Dune has all the formula, all the, all the characteristics of a classic, all the timeless themes of a human epic. And it doesn't have the fads, the 1960s 
coolness or anything else of the current age that makes it dated when 10 years go by. No, it is got themes that will live forever. And that's why Dune abides. So that is my impression of Dune's staying power and of the recent Dune movies. Please comment what you thought about the Dune movies, which one you liked best, whether you thought any of them were faithful to the book at all, <laughs> and, and whether or not you would go to see the next one, too. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk slash science fiction word. Also, check out my books on Amazon. I will have the links in the description as always. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.